Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. And you are watching Marksman TV. Welcome back to another weekly used gun review. Remember, in these videos, I take about eight used firearms that have come into the store either through our website or through the front door and give you guys about a two to four minute review of each to give you guys an idea of some different stuff out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is strictly to be entertaining and educational. We are not making this video to sell anything to keep in accordance with UDEEP's policies. Anyway, guys with all of that out of the way let's go ahead and jump into it now all right this video is brought to you by our new website webuyguns.com if you have a firearm or firearms collection you are looking to sell please log on to our website create an account and submit your firearms for an offer review now with the offer you do receive a printable offer certificate which you can take with you to competing gun stores to try and leverage yourself a better deal if you're unable to get a better deal go ahead and sell it to us we do provide you with the shipping label and we do pay you with either a check or ACH direct deposit to make the process as seamless as possible anyway guys go check us out again at webuyguns.com remembering the format of this video. We are gonna start off with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. Starting us off, I do have a pistol that I am actually pretty fond of. This is a 2075 Rami from CZ. Now I have gotten quite a few of these in since we launched our site. We've got one from a viewer in Texas, also one from a viewer in Illinois. So thank you so much for sending that uh, those along to us. Uh, as well as uh, this particular one comes to us from a local uh, so again, thanks to everybody who has sold us these, but actually, surprisingly, I have gotten quite a few of these lately, but they are not that commonly found. Uh, not a lot of them do show up at gun stores and gun shows, but they are a really, really nice little pistol if you ever get the chance to take a look at one. This is essentially a subcompact variant of the CZ-75. Now, you can get the CZ-75 uh, Compact, excuse me, which is going to be more indicative and have similar lines as the base model CZ-75. But this does go beyond that. It does have a little bit of a difference in terms of aesthetic and feel and it is absolutely overall smaller you have the 10 round base uh, magazine capacity or 14 round extended they do make this into 40 they did have a variation with the polymer frame although i have not seen one of those personally and this would hit the market in about 2004. Uh, they are you know, the way that other CZ pistols work, just like the CZ-75, you have the slide inside the frame. So you do have a very shallow uh, contour here on the slide, not a whole lot to grip onto, but that is gonna keep muzzle flip down, uh, keep your re recoil really easily mitigated, especially on a small uh, package like this. It does have a full metal frame and slide, so good about amount of weight for what it is. So can be used as a concealed carry. To me, the, the footprint of this is very similar to something like a Glock 26. So that's the, uh, have a hammer which is uh, double action and single action this particular model is the d model with the d cocker you can get the version that has a manual safety instead of the d cocker uh, this one has night sights on it so they are a really really nice package uh, something i've always had my eye on that i just generally really like so if you like the size of a cz 75 or the feel of a cc 75 the controls and all of that you would feel right at home on something like this as a concealed carry uh, it is a little bit heavy and bulky but Overall, so I really like the, the overall feel of the firearm. Um, if we look at the market on these, it really has not fluctuated a whole lot due to everything that's been going on, uh, you know, politically and with the pandemic and all that that's caused the pricing to come up. But it should be currently at about the five to $600 range on these used, which is about typically what they would sell for new. So the pricing's at maybe 50 to $100 on them. So um, again, I am coming across quite a few of them. I'm sure a lot of people out there own them, but they are one of those firearms that still a lot of people come into my store and they see one and they ask about what it is. It just does not get that much press compared to things like the CZ-75 or 75 Compact or SP-01 or other things like that. So this is kind of one of those that is easily ignored, but definitely one that people should take a look at. So that's gonna be our number one spot, the 2075 Rami. Okay, up next, I have a pretty desirable pistol that has just come out onto the market. This is the Springfield Ronin 1911 A1 configuration handgun. Uh, the Ronin would have hit the market about a year ago, and this is actually the first one that I've ever had in, and it happens to be a used one. Now, I am a part of the Springfield Stocking Dealer program. I do have one of these on order through that program, but I have yet to receive it. So kind of interesting that I'm really getting my first one as a used firearm. So this actually comes to us from a really uh, good local customer here. So again, thank you. I know he watches the videos. So thank you uh, for bringing this one in. I'd actually like to do a comparison with this and just the base model 1911 
uh, A1, the uh, mil spec that they put out, because that is ultimately what makes this such an attractive package. Now, real quick, what this is, the Ronin is part of the newest member, I should say, of the Springfield 1911 lineup. It has a lot of really nice upgraded features on it. You have this really nice, beautiful blue in here, stainless finish on the frame. Now, both the frame and the slide are cold hammer forged. Uh, you have nice upgraded features like an extended beaver tail, skeletonized hammer and trigger, fiber optic front sight. You have their like racking rear sight with this ledge on it that you can use to one hand manipulate the slide against your belt loop or belt or uh, table or something like that. Rear and front slide serrations. Um, really, really nice package. This one is a nine millimeter. Uh, they also make it in 45 and recently 10 millimeter as well. And they do have it in the government size, which is this one and the commander size of four and a quarter inch barrel. The really attractive thing about this is the MSRP on this thing new. And I understand we're in weird times with the, you know, the, the market on firearms, but the new MSRP on this is $850. Now, Typically, and I know in typical circumstances, you don't typically find firearms retailing new at MSRP. Typically, they're about 50 to $100 lower. So I suspect that the average retail price on this new when things settle down and these are readily available on the market, it's probably going to be closer to $750 to $800. Now, if we look at that in terms of price of other Springfield offerings, that's about where their GI or their milk spec model would come out, which is a very base 1911. It's also very much in line with with other things like the Ruger SR 1911 uh, or the Remington R1 in terms of price. So to have those nice upgraded features, to me, this is almost like a, co a competitor to something like the Desert Eagle 1911s, which are fully loaded like this at about the same price. They're typically higher end things like the range officers and uh, try, try to think they're loaded models and things like that typically easily get up to the 900 to thousand dollar plus mark. So you have a really nice package with a lot to offer at an affordable price. Now, I understand the market's really crazy right now, and anytime there's a new release like this, the pricing is always gonna be inflated anyway. So right now, used, these are going for about $800 to $850. Uh, but again, the whole principle here is to get a really nice loaded package at an affordable price in line with what was typically uh, what people would pay for just a base watered down model. So really, really cool to get that in Springfield Armory Ronin. And again, I might hold on to this for a little bit and do a comparison video as, Lately, I haven't been able to do a lot of those because I haven't been able to get much uh, new firearm inventory as, you know, supply has been pretty bad. So anyway, really cool to get that in. That is the Springfield Ronin. Okay, up next is a really cool firearm. I always really enjoy seeing these Ruger yellow boxes, but this comes to us from a viewer of the channel and a local customer who brought this in actually today. But this is a Ruger standard model, 22 pistol, again in its original box. And the magazine catches here down at the heel. It's, of course, one thing that they would change on later design iterations. The story on this actually would get begin back just post-World War II. We all know that Bill Ruger was the founder of the Ruger company, Sturm Ruger, but it all really started with this pistol. So as Marines were returning home from the Pacific Theater, a lot of them brought home more souvenirs, many of which were the Japanese Nambu Type 14 pistols. Now, Bill Ruger had procured a couple of these pistols and took them back to, you know, took them back home, and decided to start tinkering with them and think if he could come up with a production firearm that was similar in function, but on a 22 caliber. So after a couple years of working around with it, he did design this firearm, the standard model. Now at that time, again, he had no company. This is something he was doing on his own time. If you're familiar with the Nambu pistols, the aesthetic is actually very similar to this. A lot of people look at this and think more like a German Luger. Uh, but if you look at a Type 14, I'll roll in a picture, you actually have a cocking knob here in the back that you grab and you bring the bolt inside the pistol back to the rear and that's how you chamber around inside the pistol. So this is really more indicative of a, of a Type 14 Nambu from Japan. Now, he had come up with this design. It worked really, really well. One of the real uh, successful principles was this kind of secondary bolt feature where most traditional handguns had an entire slide that had to move and you are dependent on the recoil energy or the energy from that round being fired to reciprocate the entire slide. That's why traditionally some automatic 22s are not inherently reliable because you have a lot of mass that's required to move under such a small amount of pressure. When you remove the entirety of the slide that needs to be moved and just change it out for a lightweight bolt, it increases greatly the 
you know, the, uh, the or lessens, I should say, the likelihood of jams or other things like that. So why, you know, 1022s are generally very reliable. You have such a small amount of mass that's needed to move. Now, he did meet up with an investor named Alex Sturm, and he looked at the pistol, and he was actually very impressed with its mechanics and its ergonomics, and he decided that he wanted to invest in this new venture with uh, Bill Ruger, so together they would establish Sturm Ruger, and this would be their number one product that they would put out. So this would really be the reason, or, or sort of the, the springboard for the new company being founded, and of course it would go on to be one of the largest and most successful American uh, founded uh, firearms manufacturers manufacturers and it would all start right here. Now many of you have seen the Ruger Mark series pistols. You would have the Mark 1 targets that would come right after this with a longer heavier profile barrel. The Mark 2s and then the Mark 3s you have the actual thumb magazine release the 2245 with the actual 45 uh, like more indicative of the 11 degree grip angle from the 1911 service pistol and then all the way up to the Mark IVs, which is where we are today, uh, which incorporates more of an easy disassembly system. One of these, uh, these guys are actually really difficult to disassemble, but so too are the Japanese Nambus, but there's really no similarity there. Uh, very dis uh, difficult to take apart and to maintain in service if you've ever tried to take apart a Mark I through three. The Mark IVs, you just have a little button under here, the whole thing pivots up and off. You pull your bolt out, really easy to take care of. You have the Target mod uh, models, the uh, Tallow Edition models, the Hunter models, you have the, uh, again, the 2245, the lightweight series. So the list really goes on and all the stuff that is out there on the market. So just a really, really cool pistol. And I love seeing these things come in. Um, an early standard model like this with its original metal plate, uh, base plated magazine um, in its original box with paperwork in good condition is not exceedingly high. Something like this, this package might run you about the $400 or so range. Uh, but they are steadily climbing because of the collectability of them. So again, a Ruger collector, this is like in mint condition. This is probably in 98, 99% in its box. So again, it's not a super high-end, highly sought after collectible, but there are Ruger collectors on things like this to round out a collection, you know, a Mark series collection or a Target pistol collection. So still really cool nonetheless. Really happy to get that in and share it with you guys. That'll be our number three spot, a Ruger Standard Model 22. Okay, up next I have a couple handguns and I really love it when these things come in. You guys saw a couple of these on a video maybe a week or two ago. Uh, but right here I have a 5946. This one comes to us from a viewer in Utah. So thank you so much for sending that one along to us. And this one here is a 3913, which comes to us from a viewer in New York. So again, thank you so much for sending these along. I'm gonna take these boxes out of the way. So the third generation Smith & Wessons, there are a ton of these out on the market of all different shapes and sizes. There are different charts out there that you can look at at all the different models, the finishes, the calibers, the sizes, whether it's double action only, single action only, double or single action. Um, I mean, there's gotta be somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 to 30 plus different variations of these third generation Smith & Wesson pistols, and there's a lot of collectors out there on them. Uh, these both happen to be nine millimeter. This one, the 5946, is a full steel frame, nine millimeter, and it is a single action only. So with that back, I'm sorry, it's a double action only. So hammer does not stay back, it stays on double action, but the handgun has to recycle for it to reset. And again, goes back to uh, double action only. Uh, double stack magazine. Now, these would have actually seen some use with the FBI uh, as well as the NYPD. Now, that's one thing about these third generation Smiths is a lots of different variations of these would see use with different law enforcement departments like the 4006 saw service with like the California Highway Patrol, for example. Uh, as we were moving through the 1980s into the 1990s, a lot of police departments wanted to get away from the standard issue service revolver and get into a semi-automatic. These would bridge the gap between the 80s and the 90s when the Glocks would come on board. Uh, those themselves would actually replace a lot of Model 10s and stuff like that. And Glock had their LE trade-in uh, programs that they offered and stuff like that. Um, there's a really good book written about that from Paul Barrett called Glock, uh, Glock The Rise of America's Handgun. But I do digress. They talk about sort of the, the 80s and the 90s where these things were common in the transition to the semi-automatic handgun. So it's a good read if nobody's read it before. But um, 
Again, these small uh, compact versions, this is a alloy frame, this one's a steel frame. Uh, the 3913 is a double or single action, nine millimeter with a decocker on it. So again, there's just a million different variations of these things. The 5903 and 5906 are probably the most commonly found police surplus Smith third generations. And the good thing about that is you could find different variations of these for really not a whole lot of money as police surplus. So the police surplus variants that come maybe in a cardboard box with you know rough hand grips and stuff like that on them you might be able to find something like that for about the three to four hundred dollar range now the firearms that have been manufactured for and sold on the commercial market kept with their original factory boxes like this do go up a little bit higher and these are gaining a little bit more popularity and collectability as well uh, these each with their original boxes might be in about the five to six hundred dollar range so again very affordable if you've never picked up a third generation smith especially i like the ones with the steel frames they just feel really really good in the hand and they are a ton of fun out on the range and a really inexpensive option if you are maybe a first-time buyer looking for something very robust and very rugged that's enjoyable to shoot that is not a whole lot of money and is very reliable so these things i think are really underrated and there's something for everybody because again there's like 40 different models of these you can pick whether it's a 10 a 9 a 40 a 45 uh different sizes whether it's a double or a single a double action only or single action whatever you like so Really, really cool to collect. Really, really cool to own. Really glad to get a couple more of these in here. And as I get them in, I'll make sure I try and get them more in the video so you guys can see just the wide variety of these things that exist. So anyway, some third gen Smiths, a model 5946 and a 3913. Okay, up next is a really cool revolver that comes to us from the same viewer who sold me the Yellow Box Ruger Standard Model. So again, thank you so much for selling these to me. Uh, this is a Colt Mark III Lawman 357 revolver in the two inch barrel. They also made this in a four inch. Uh, this is the blued finish. They had a nickel variation as well. The story on this begins actually, if we look back post-World War II, maybe about the 1950s, Colt as a company is actually doing pretty well. Um, they had just come off of a large government contract for production of the 1911A1 service sidearm, the 1911-45 ACP. Um, if we look at the revolver market, in 1955, Colt had just released the Colt Python, which was a huge splash in the market and a huge success, and still is today. If we look at their pre-war offerings, the Police Positive, the Police Special, the Detective Special, they're bringing those back into production, and those are doing really well on the consumer market for concealed carry, maybe uh, security services, detective personal sidearms, things of that nature. They are introducing the commemorative line, so that's starting to come around the 1950s, 1960s. Now, through the 1960s, there's a couple changes that are starting to happen economically and within terms of labor. So labor expenses are going up. At the time, Colt employed a lot of master gunsmiths and technicians, really artisans of their craft, to put together their firearms, more specifically their revolver lines. So the Colt Pythons are early variations um, were put together by hand. In fact, the early, for like the first two or three years of production, only two people alone at Colt were allowed to touch the revolvers other than the final polishing or finishing. Uh, just two individuals made all of them by hand. So they really had a lot of pride in their workmanship and their quality, but that was back when that was affordable. We get into the 1970s and that's really starting to change. Smith & Wesson is coming online with a lot of uh, interesting offerings in their K-frame line, which is gaining a lot of popularity with police departments. Now, that was one hole in Colt's manufacturing lineup was the police market. It was huge opportunity, but due to the growing expense of putting these things together, uh, and typically police departments, which need to stay to a pretty strict budget, it was really hard to get these police departments to do things like buy a Python or a Cobra. Um, the detective specials were uh, of a, a too low of a caliber and too small. You had the police positives and things like that, but those were also put together by hand by the same manufacturers of the Python. So you did not really save much in terms of your uh, your overhead in the manufacturing. So Colt wanted to come out with a new line that was really geared up for the more modern means of production. And they would come out with the Mark III series. Now out of that series, you had the Lawman and you had the Trooper. Now of the two, the Trooper was really meant to be the more higher end premium version. You would have things like uh, some cases like larger target grips on them, uh, adjustable sights, uh, things of that nature. And then you have the Lawman series, which was this, uh, which they had again in the two inch and the four inch, the four inch being more popular for a service revolver, but was really meant to be economical. It was meant to have things like fixed sights, uh, a Earlier ones had a narrow spur hammer, earlier ones had an exposed ejector rod, uh, earlier ones had thinner panel grips. 
so really it meant to be affordable for police departments and security firms, and that's really where this would come into play. These would stay in production until about the early 1980s, and then they would cease production on the Lawmen and the Troopers, part of the Mark III series. So they are really, really cool revolvers. Um, 357, six round capacity. This one's got a cut, it looks like, for moon clips. Um, really, really cool. Uh, if we look at the pricing on these, if you have them in excellent condition, and this one is in fantastic condition, in its original box, which this one does not have, it'd be around the $1,100 mark. Now, without its original box, this one actually does have a little bit of surface rust right over here on the finish. The finish has been eaten up a little bit over here. Other than that, it's immaculate. You might be looking at about the six to $700 range. So they are uh, still very, very nice collectible revolvers is being made by Colt. Uh, really happy to, again, to get this one in and share it with you. So there is a Colt Mark III Lawman. Okay, up next is one that comes to us from a viewer in Michigan. So thank you so much for sending this along to us. This is a Calico M100. I'm gonna pull it out of the box here and be right back with you. Okay, there it is in all its glory, the Calico M100. If you've never seen one of these, they are a very interesting and unique firearm. I'll pull it out of here of the foam. Um, Calico as a company would be founded in 1985. This is basically the main thing that they focused on was really this type of magazine. It is known as a helical magazine. They made these in 22 and 9 millimeter. The 9 millimeter mags could hold between 50 to 100 rounds. I don't actually know specifically what the capacity was on the 22. My guess would be, my guess would be 100 based on the model, the M100. But I'll actually have to look that up. I'll roll that down uh, down below. Should have looked that up before I started. But you basically load in the magazines and then you wind the magazine with this little crank here and you have 100 rounds. They did make submachine gun fully automatic versions of this and actually intended to market it to law enforcement and military due to their lightweight ergonomics, uh, high capacity, and actually they are very reliable. Uh, the whole package does balance kind of weird, a lot of weight here on the back end, especially loaded as you can imagine. Uh, very lightweight up here at the front, but similar to something like a bullpup. This had a, see if I can remember how to do this. You have a latch here. This folds over and open, and you have a collapsing stock here in the back. So just kind of cool. I mean, if this doesn't scream the 1980s to you, I don't know what will. Uh, this was used in films like Spaceballs for the futuristic look, some James Bond movies. Uh, helical magazine, you have two clamps right here on either side. You push, and that drops right out of the back, and there is your mag. Some of the 9mm versions, and I've had one in here before, I think the Liberty is what they call it actually have your sight system on top of the magazine itself. Uh, you'd actually sight over the top of the mag. So really, really cool. Now, when the assault weapons ban of the 1990s would come into effect, these would actually be banned from being manufactured and sold, which did put a little bit of a hindrance on the manufacturing of the company because this was actually really their only product type that they would put out. Uh, in 2012, they did introduce a helical magazine shotgun. I don't know much of what that has done. I, I don't think I've ever seen one. I did actually go out to their website and apparently they are still around, still manufacturing these, but I have not seen a new one of these out on the market really ever. Uh, the only calicos I've ever seen have been more retro 1980s, early 1990s versions like this. So based on looking at their pictures, they have not made much of a design change. I don't know if you can special order them from them or not, so I've not looked into that. If we look at the market on something like this, the price in the box on a model like this uh, might start at somewhere around the $700 mark plus. Uh, so actually for what they are, they are gaining some value. Um, just really, really cool nonetheless. I don't really see too many of them. Uh, so when they come in, I mean, they're definitely interesting and there's always buyers on them. For somebody who's looking for something that's a little bit unique and not really too commonly found out there on the market and also much of a range novelty as well. I imagine this and 22 long rifle would be a lot of fun out on the range. Uh, but anyway, really, really happy to get that in. Thank you again to our viewer in Michigan. That is a Calico M100. Okay, up next I have a really cool rifle that comes to us from the same viewer in Michigan. So thank you so much for using our site and sending this one along to us. This is a Norinco NHM91 RPK style sporter AK something, if you will. Um, I'm going to try and lay this down, give you guys a little bit of a better view of what we're looking at here. I know it's kind of long and hard to keep in there. Um, the story with this would actually begin in about the 1980s. Now, on the civilian consumer market, there was a huge need for AK variants. 
At the time, you had the Mahdi's that were coming in, the FN Mahdi's, uh, FN manufacturer Mahdi's, the Egyptian Mahdi's, and the Finnish Valmet rifles. Now, both of them were very expensive. To get something more affordable onto the market, China would bring in, through Norinco and Polytech, versions of their AK patterns, the Type 56, the S1, the S2, the S3, and these would be really affordable. Polytech had the Polytech Legends on the milled receivers, and those are typically, I mean, at the time, maybe in the three to $500 price range, depending on, you know, when it was bought, what it was, what it came with, that sort of thing. Now, those would stay really, really popular on the market. There was a uh, event that happened at, at Stockton, California, involving a Norinco AK, uh, which led to a lot of debate over the legality or whether we should have these types of assault rifles in our community. Now, then... Uh, George Bush Sr., President George Bush Sr. in 1989 would implement the importation ban on such Chinese manufactured AKs, which will lead to things like the Mac 90 and the Mac 91, which were basically watered down AK variants of their former selves. So you would have things like thumbhole stocks like this, uh, no threaded barrel. So the, the firearm would have to come in for a sporting purpose. So it would be changed to look like a sporting rifle and that would be the Mac 90, which is its traditional barrel length and whatnot. Now in 19, uh, yeah, 1991, they would come up with the NHM 91, which is what this is, which was meant to be a sporter RPK variant of the Mac 90, which is essentially all it was, was a Mac 90 with a longer barrel on it and a bipod. It's really all it was. Uh, it did come with a set of wood furniture with a thumbhole stock and grip that was actually manufactured in the United States. I'll actually have the original set. Let me grab it real quick. Uh, here that is right here. So this is the furniture that would have originally been on it. This actually you'll see are no vents cut into it uh, because they believed for a sporting purpose, you wouldn't be you know, blasting away on this, uh, you know, at a high rate of fire, you know, you'd be firing one round every minute or whatever. So no need for uh, cooling vents on the side of the handguard. So it was really just meant to be a watered down sporting rifle, no threaded muzzle, no bayonet lug or anything like that. Now, unfortunately, in 1994, then President Clinton would pass the assault weapons ban, which would wipe out any future importation and retail sales of things like the NHM 91, the Mac 90s, and so on. So this really actually only have been imported for three years, which makes them pretty rare. But because of their configuration, they are not super highly sought after. I mean, compared to other things like Polytech Legends and uh, pre-banned Norinkos and things like that. So on the retail market, these tend to start at about the $1,250 range and work their way up based on, you know, what they come with and condition and things like that. It was very common to find these with post-market replacement stocks, again, because this is not really appealing to a lot of people who would be interested in such things like an RPK. Uh, but you could actually get normal stock configurations and handguards and put them on here, no problem, as you can see. Uh, they did make a slant back and a squared back variation. I have not had this stock off, so I don't know what this is specifically. But if we look at the original stock that was on it, I would say it's a pretty good guess that this was actually, this is a square back, which again makes it more compatible um, with different aftermarket stocks. Any just traditional AKM stocks should just fit right in, no problem like anything else. Same with the handguards. So you could really mix and match and do whatever you wanted to do drum magazines as well. I do not believe that these actually came with drum mags. They typically would have just come with a, actually the early ones actually even had a riveted uh, block to only accept, I think like the five or 10 round magazine. So I'm not too sure what those would have come with originally, but anyway, um, still really cool nonetheless. It is basically just a long barrel Mac 90 to make it look like an RPK. Um, they did actually have the pre ban era RPKs with the actual Chinese or Norinco like RPK stock, which is longer than a traditional RPK stock in the hand guards. But if you find one of those, those are very few and far between. Those are going to be very expensive. But this is a good stand in nonetheless. It's still a rare rifle at only having been made or brought into the country for about three years. So happy to take a look at that one for you guys the NHM 91. All right, last but not least, I have a really unique rifle, which comes to us again from the same viewer who sold us the Calico and the NHM 91. So again, thank you so much for these awesome firearms that I can share on these videos. 
But this is an Olympic Arms pre-ban, C-A-R-A-R. -A -A now, the company Olympic Arms was actually founded as SGW, Schutz and Gun Works, by a gentleman by the name of Robert Schutz in about 1956. In 1975, he would join forces with a gentleman of the name of P.O. Ackley, who was a really good and really well-known and respected gunsmith at the time. They would move the company out to Olympia, Washington, where they would manufacture high-precision rifle barrels, uh, basically other high, really they were really focused more on parts manufacturing for precision, really well made, really well machined parts. Now in the early 1980s, around 1982, they would start with the idea of moving into AR-15 production, which is what this is. Now around that time, they would go ahead and transition the name away from SGW, Schutz and Gun Works, to Olympic Arms. And you would start seeing trademark shifts in their products. Now this actually has the old retro stop sign SGW logo on the receiver, which is a desirable collectible, uh, collectible idea or asset, I guess, for the firearm, for collectors of Olympic arms, firearms. But over here, you also have the new trade name Olympic arms. This is kind of a made in, in the transition between the two names or the two brands. And anything that you see, it's an AR-15 with the SGW logo on it is absolutely going to be a pre-band. So you have the pre-band, you know, features like the bayonet lug and whatnot, pistol grip and all that sort of stuff. So very collectible for what they are. Now back at the time that these would be manufactured, there would really only be about three prominent AR-15 manufacturers. There was Colt, Bushmaster, and then SGW or Olympic Arms. Now Olympic Arms was a pioneer in many different ways. They would come out with things like the free float handguard and the pistol caliber variations of the AR-15 uh, platform, the 9, the 40, the 45. It was really the really groundbreaking movements taken by Olympic Arms. Now, they would have some other interesting things in their history, like in 2013, they would stop all contracts with the New York Police Department following the New York State Assault Weapons Ban. Uh, so that's interesting. But unfortunately, in 2017, they did uh, go completely out of business, and they are currently, as of today, a defunct company, no longer manufacturing firearms. Uh, this is an early teardrop forward assist. Uh, A2 carry handle with rear adjustments here on the back. C.A.R style metal these are actually highly desirable uh, metal um, retractable two position stocks people will take these off and do like colt retro builds and stuff like that but it's just a really really cool firearm nonetheless now the interesting thing about olympic arms firearms is if you look at the modern production ones the ones that have been made within the past you know 10 or so years before they would go out of business they were actually not very well respected for their quality and their craftsmanship may have been one of the reasons they actually finally went out of business so newer production olympic arms ars do not bring a whole lot of money the pre-band ones like this are actually more desirable. Uh, this one's actually a four, it's a T, uh, it's a four digit serial number. So this is a really early one. Again, transitional logos and everything. Uh, but these are actually pretty desirable and they are, are getting up there in price. You're easily at about the $1,500, $1,600 plus range if you look at the market currently right now. And that's up quite a bit from where they were even three or four years ago. So they are climbing pretty fast. Typically you see them with the moderators on the end. This one does not have that. Just a standard thread, threaded barrel and the previous owner switched out this kind of muzzle brake device as opposed to just a standard bird cage flash hider which would have likely been on it uh a from the era red dot the ultra dot from oak shore electronic um, just a really cool retro ar-15 not much else to say about it uh, but anyway thank you again to the gentleman in michigan who sold this one to us as well as the other two and i'm really happy to get some cool classic pre-bands in the videos for you guys so we'll end it up with that one well that is all the time i have for you today on these thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video if you enjoyed please let me know by hitting that like button and also please consider subscribing to my channel and do hit that bell notification button as I do post these videos every week. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.